In 1900, a country the size of a continent simply just came into existence. What started as a set of British colonies that were designed to punish its criminals, this new country, Australia, now stood with a landmass of 32 times that of its mother country. But unlike the USA, there was no war of independence and no common enemy for these independent colonies to rally around. They simply agreed to federate. And so premiers who had all sorts of localized power over their British colonies now surrendered that to this emerging colossus of a federal government. No dramas, right? Well, not even close. This is the inside story of the history of Australian Parliament. The power struggles, the conniving lies, and in the midst of all of these, the unbelievable triumphs. Okay, so welcome to our first episode of Labor, Liberal and Lies. I'm so pumped to be beginning this series, and we're going to begin our first episode by of course looking at Australia's first Prime Minister, Edmund Barton. But to understand him and the power struggles that went on in his cabinet, we have to understand the background of Federation. And so Barton was an especially strong negotiator who started as a member of the New South Wales colonial government back in 1880. In fact, his knack for negotiating disputes was recognised so early, and he was made the Speaker of the House. In Australia, the Speaker rescinds their voting rights to convene Parliament and ensure order in the House. Order! And so during this era, the New South Wales Parliament was beginning to split into two factions. On the one hand, there were the free traders led by Sir Henry Parks, and as the name suggests, they advocated for minimal taxes on foreign imports, and advocated for increased trade in a world that was becoming far more connected. On the other hand, there were Barton's protectionists who wanted to protect Australian industries by taxing imports from other countries. There was also a third party in the mix, the Labour Party. This was a party made up of unionists and blue collar workers, and they typically sided with the protectionists as they advocated for the protection of Australian industries. But they sometimes sided with the free traders too. And so this will be today's subscriber question. If you were alive in Barton's era, who would you vote for? The protectionists, the free traders, or for Labour? But back to Barton. In 1889, the legendary Premier and Barton's rival, Sir Henry Parks, gave his famous Tenerfield speech, where he urged the Australian colonies to form a united federation, and Barton was really captivated by this. From there, momentum started to grow and there was a federal convention held in Sydney, and Barton was selected as one of seven delegates from New South Wales. Essentially, at this convention, Barton wrote most of what would become the Australian Constitution. Now, close to death, the legendary Parks resigned as the Premier, and he was replaced by fellow free trader and Federation advocate, George Reid. He'll become really important next week. And so, fast forward to 1897 and a second federal convention was held. Essentially, the smaller colonies like Tasmania and South Australia were advocating for a Senate that had more power than the lower house. You see, the House of Reps is voted according to electorates, and elections are determined by population. Alternatively, the Senate is elected according to each state's receiving an allocation. As South Australia and Tasmania had less people than New South Wales and Victoria, a powerful Senate would suit them. But for Victoria and New South Wales, this was completely undemocratic and totally unacceptable. But like I said, Barton knew how to compromise and proposed that the Senate could have veto power, but not on financial bills. And so Federation was to go ahead. Each colony was to have a referendum on whether they wanted to join this new Australia. And even if Western Australia and Queensland didn't vote yes, like some suspected, the southeastern colonies knew they could form their own union regardless. But in New South Wales, there was to be a big hiccup. You see, George Reid's free trader controlled parliament said that New South Wales didn't just need a majority, which was around 68,000 votes, they needed a clear majority of 80,000, and they fell short. The yes vote did win, but it only won 71,500 to 66,000. Even though they were on opposite sides, Barton had long seen Reid as an ally for the Federation cause, and he felt utterly betrayed. So what do you do? Well, Barton then went and challenged Reid in his own seat for the 1898 New South Wales election, and he only narrowly lost. Have you come to destroy me, Obi-Wan? I will do what I must. Then you will die. Even so, a protectionist backbencher stepped down for Barton and he became the opposition leader. So, Barton continued to lobby harder for Federation, and he got his victory on a revote, with New South Wales achieving 107,500 votes for yes and 83,000 votes for no. But despite this, Barton was too much of a negotiator to be an effective opposition leader, and he stepped down for anti-federalist William Lyon. 
For this election cycle, Labor had been working with the Free Traders, but Lyon persuaded them to desert Reid for the Protectionists, and he became the Premier. Now, this was important because the general agreement was that the New South Wales Premier would be the first Prime Minister because they were the senior colony. But after all, Lyon didn't even believe in the cause. And so this was the deal. Lyon would nominate Barden to be the Prime Minister on his behalf, while he would continue to govern New South Wales as his Premier. But of course, before all this could happen, the British government had to sign off on it because they were British colonies. And so Barton led the delegation that went to Britain, but Britain pushed back against Barton's idea for an Australian High Court. They argued that the highest court in Australia should be a British court because that's where the expertise on British common law was. Barton's rebuttal was simple. We wrote the constitution, we have the right to interpret it. The matter was settled and the laws were about to go through, but there'd be one final twist. William Lyon seemed to have a change of heart. Now that Federation was happening, regardless of whether he liked it or not, he was about to turn down the most powerful post on the continent. And so Lyon set sail for the motherland to take the post as Australian Prime Minister. Obviously, Barton was incensed and refused to join the cabinet of ministers that Lyon was forming. Ironically, Barton's foe, George Reid, was the one who came to the rescue. Reid and Barton had their ideological differences, but they were united on the need for a federation and they were friends. For Reid, a protectionist was going to be prime minister no matter what. So, better his friend Barton than the unknown rival in Lyon. Reid persuaded all the premiers from other states to refuse to join Lyon's cabinet, and Lyon had no choice but to stand down. Barton would return to Australia as his Prime Minister-elect. So Barton's cabinet was supposed to be the dream team. Effectively, there were six ex-premiers serving as his ministers, and they got to work right away by implementing tariffs. Interestingly, these tariffs were less to protect industry, but actually to raise revenue for this new Commonwealth government because the states got to keep their income and land tax rights at this stage. The first notable policy that the Barton government passed would go down as one of Australia's most notorious policies of all time. The Immigration Restriction Act of 1901, otherwise known as the White Australia Policy. Now, yes, this was a racist policy, but there was a little bit more to it than meets the eye. Like I said, the protectionists wanted to protect Australian industry and Labor wanted to protect Australian workers. Now, what had happened was that Queensland were using Pacific Islanders basically as slave labor in its cane fields. This led to the belief that non-Europeans would price Australian workers out of work, and so the proposal was that only Europeans be allowed migration into Australia. But this greatly upset the motherland. Britain had a worldwide empire that included India and a growing alliance with Japan. Having initially proposed a 50-word dictation test in English, Barton compromised and allowed the test to be in any European language. The government also compensated the sugar industry by placing bounties on sugar grown by white labour. Now, in the 1901 election, Barton's protectionists won 32 seats, the Free Traders picked up 27, and Labour picked up 16 and threw its support behind Barton's protectionists once again. However, the early 1900s was an era of loose party discipline. Today, parties always vote as a unified bloc unless the leader of the party allows for a conscience vote, usually on social issues such as abortion. But the early 1900s saw a system closer to America's, where dissenting voices were allowed, and the party was nothing more binding than, say, a survivor alliance. Poverty. D Tyson. After this election, Barton would go on to have two main accomplishments. Number one, an old age pension was introduced, and number two, Barton established the High Court of Australia that he fought against the British for, and that's about to get really important. So basically, there was one bill which tore the Australian Parliament apart during the beginning of the century, which was the Conciliation and Arbitration Bill. Essentially, this was a bill to set up a court that would hear industrial matters and establish the rule of law within the workplace. For instance, someone working on the docks could take their boss to this court for not paying their wages. Now, this sounds like a no-brainer, right? But the specifics tore Parliament apart. Firstly, Barton's trade minister, Charles Kingston, proposed that the bill also extend to merchant seamen. Now, this proposal was rejected by the protectionists. Like I said before, party discipline was loose in the early years of Federation. And so, to Barton's surprise, Kingston just resigned. If, as the Minister for Trade, he couldn't get his way on an industrial bill, what influence could he actually wield? This created a huge issue for the protectionists, though. Kingston was the most trusted protectionist minister in the eyes of Labor, and this key coalition was starting to fracture. Labor also had its issues with the bill wanting state government employees like railway workers covered under the Act. With the cabinet being made up of many ex-state premiers who would see their colleagues constantly embattled in court, the protectionists rejected it. And so Australia was left in a standoff. 
The protectionists needed Labour to govern, yet they rejected Labour's proposal. Ever the negotiator, Barton desperately tried to rescue the coalition, but to no avail. And so the first Prime Minister shocked the nation by resigning and taking up a position on the High Court that he himself had set up. And so Australia was given its second Prime Minister, Alfred Deakin, and he had the impossible job of reunifying the coalition. Deakin was a funny fellow, a legendary orator who in the 19th century had served in the Victorian colonial parliament. His maiden speech also happened to be his resignation speech as there were doubts over his polling. Now, Deakin knew that there was no saving this fractured relationship, and so he waited six months for the 1903 election to roll around. He gambled that the public would see how ineffective a three-party system was, and that Labor voters would flip to the protectionists. In December, the polls came in. The protectionists picked up 26 seats, their opposition, the free traders, picked up 24, but to Deakin's surprise, Labor picked up 22. This was the three-way tie. Deakin's nightmare scenario. Thanks for watching. You can't miss next week as Deacon makes one of the biggest political gambles I think any Australian politician has ever made. If you liked the video, don't forget to hit that like button and consider subscribing so you don't miss out on future episodes. We can't wait to see you next time for our next venture into a fascinating part of history.